Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to just unplug from the daily grind and just think for a moment about your will and your ways. And especially as we continue to get some handle on these world religions, we just ask that your spirit would guide and direct. Father, our motivation in doing this is just to understand our neighbor. You've called us to love our neighbor, and Father, we believe that in order to love him or her the way you would have us love, then we need to listen and we need to understand. And so, Father, that's, that's what we're doing. We're just trying to understand our neighbor. And uh, so when we speak to them of the love of Christ, we speak to them in a way that's caring and understanding, and not just preaching at them, but walking with them through whatever challenges they're facing and knowing their language and knowing their heart. So, Father, we just ask you would help us uh, get this understanding as we move forward. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So, here we are on part two of Hinduism. Uh, last session, if you remember it, it's a long time ago now. It's like ancient history, right? So, what, what's that fish in that movie, Every Day She Makes New Friends? I'm starting to get to that age, where every day I make new friends, you know? Uh, so the last time, if you remember... We kind of begun looking at the session called Origins, and we looked at the beginning of the Hindu culture from uh, that 4th century BC estimate uh, up through kind of that 800-year period, 400 years before Christ to after Christ, and uh, the development, we got to that place, and we kind of ended with that statement and that summary of this treatise this story, this epic, if you will, called Bhagavad Gita, and we'll bring that up in a moment. But just for those of you that weren't here, or those of you who forgot you were here, that's what we did last time, all right? So <laughs> there we are. So uh, what we want to do now is kind of go beyond that. And in this session, we want to talk about this phenomenon called the Trimurti. What is that in Hinduism, and um, what does that mean with regard to the development of that? We're going to, and then show how Hinduism kind of evolves and changes as it encounters these other forces. Uh, and so we'll, with, with what time we have remaining, we'll talk about how Hinduism and Christianity encounter one another, encounters with Islam, that long period of history where we have the British Raj or what was known as the British India Empire, um, and then if we have time, we'll look at kind of two religions developed alongside of Hinduism, Jainism and Sikhism, and uh, that will kind of summarize, that will get us through this whole session on Hinduism. Next week, by the way, if you come back, we'll start the study of Buddhism. So that's kind of how it has to work. And regardless of how much we get through today, I do have to pick up with Buddhism next week or else we'll never get to the end of this story. So that's just the way we'll do it. So let me just talk a little bit about what I've called the rise of the Trimurti. And essentially, we're picking up where we left off in our last session. You remember when we ended with the discussion of the Bhagavad Gita, I said that part of the message that comes out of the Bhagavad Gita, and you remember that was the dialogue that this Kshatriya warrior, Arjuna, had with his chariot driver, who actually turns out to be a avatar of one of the Hindu gods, Krishna, uh, he has this ongoing conversation. And during that conversation and the story that surrounds it, you kind of emerge with these mm, three different ways that a person experiences release. You remember in Hinduism, the whole goal is to get out of this wheel of rebirth, samsara. Th this the fact that um, all the evil that you do in your life, the karma, keeps you going around and around this wheel of rebirth. And the whole goal is to get out of that wheel of rebirth. Well, how do you do that? And you remember as that conversation went on and as the story of the Bhagavad Gita unfolds along with some of the other epics outside of that, we basically arrive at three different ways that you can be released from this cycle. One is the way of duty or the, the way of works, if you will. It's following your... Varna, your caste, what you're supposed to do, your, your role as a householder, your role of where you are, to do your duty and do it well. And through that, reduce the karma in your life so that next time you come back, you can come back a little better than you were this week's or this, this life. So you can continue to work 
to the path of works. Just try to come back next time a little better off than you were this time and hope that someday you come back and you're able to release. Another way, if you want to kind of get on a faster ramp, is the way of knowledge that was outlined for us in the works called the Upanishads, where the whole idea was if you could just realize who you are, your essence, that your soul, your Atman, is identical with Brahman. And we said Brahman was that deity that's above, it's, not, it's, a, it's a force, it's, it's the God who is um, above all, without the God without attributes. And so when you realize that your soul, your Atman, is really identical with Brahman, then you're finally released. So there's this way of meditation and practice and letting go of all the things in this world so you can be reunited with Brahman. And when that happens, you can be released from this wheel of rebirth, released from the suffering and the problems of life. So that's two ways. But the third way that was suggested in the Bhagavad Gita, and that's what we're going to talk about today is the way of bhakti. And bhakti was the word for devotion. If you could f devote yourselves and worship God, a God in one of his manifestations, and we said there are millions of them, right, in the Hindu tradition. If you find, if you devote yourself to this God and you worship that God appropriately and sincerely, and in fact, develop a relationship with that God, this God can carry you into release. And so bhakti devotion becomes very important in this next phase of Hinduism because it, it, it offers you an alternative to either this relatively hopeless case of karma and doing good and this fairly impossible way of meditation. Those things seem to be very, very beyond the average ability, but introduce the idea of a God that can save you through devotion, and you set up a whole different system of uh, religion, if you will, that can really help in your own salvation. And so it's in this context that we come to this mention of what we know as the rise of the Trimurti. And Murti is the idea of a God, a God that's represented, an appearance of God, even in some cases an idol that represents God or an image that represents God. It's kind of like the three faces or the three revelations of God. So again, in Hinduism, there's one God behind everything called Brahman, but that God has no attributes. So that God reveals his attributes through millions of gods. Well, out of those millions of gods, over time, three gods emerge as kind of, the, if you will, the most important or the most formative. And worship gets developed around these three gods that's why we have this idea of the Trimurti. And so there's additional layer of literature then that gets produced during this period called the Puranas. And the Puranas are not really viewed as Hindu scripture, but commentaries on Hindu scripture. And what those, and they're just uh, different divisions of them, 18 primary ones and other secondary ones. But they're stories of the various gods that originally you find in various names in the Vedas, but now they're given their own hymns. And through reading these hymns, you get new stories about these gods. And as these hymns are written, um, you end up with this picture of these three gods that kind of emerge out of the mist, if you will, as the three primary gods that drive the Hindu uh, life, that drive the universe. And they're at the very essence of everything we experience. And so um, the three gods that emerge from all this, and what you're looking at is just a, a 18th century page from one of the Puranas, so you can see the Sanskrit. Uh, and actually, not all these were written in Sanskrit. They were written in local languages. Again, they were trying to, to be written in a way that people could consume them and understand them. It was all these stories, if you will, of these gods that now they could devote themselves to in hopes that that god could release them. And the three most important and what came to be known as the Trimurti, the three gods, if you will, the three primary gods, they come by three names. One is Brahma or Brahma, uh, not Brahman, who is the god without attributes, who's behind all things. This is without the N at the end, in English at least, it's Brahma. And Brahma is the creator god. 
The second god that kind of rises to the top is Vishnu. Um, he's the sustainer god. And then we have Shiva, who's the destroyer god. And so these gods kind of rise to the top as the objects of devotion or the, the, the um, gods worthy to be worshipped. And kind of groups begun to gather in terms of relating to these gods into different groups. And I, I, cite, a, I cite one of the passages from one of these Puranas that say, Thus the one only god, and here he has a different name than Brahman, takes the de designation of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, sometimes that uh, it's with E-H, sometimes without, depending on how it's translated. Accordingly, as he creates, preserves, and destroys. So the idea, this is the one God, Brahman, but he reveals himself as a creator God, as a preserver God, as a destroyer God, and he takes these different forms of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Or sometimes you'll hear Shiv, or sometimes Shiva, or sometimes Shiva. There's different pronunciations. So anyway, those are the gods that emerge. And f folks begin to center their devotion, their bhakti, their, their, uh, their worship of these gods, devotion to these gods, on one of these three. And the first one we'll talk about is Brahma. Now, of the three, this is the one that is least worshipped. That is, there's less temples, less ceremonies devoted to this one god. Uh, various theories as to why that happens, uh, because he kind of creates and kind of goes away. The other two stay engaged in daily life is probably the best solution. But Brahma is this, um, given credit for the creator, he comes... Uh, he reveals himself. You can see he has his four heads. It's kind of he's looking in all directions. Uh, he's seen as the creator, not just of the universe, but of the Vedas. Remember, there were four Vedas. And he's seen as kind of the source of the four Vedas. Uh, he's, he creates, and, but it's an interesting creation story. I think I said last week that one of the joys of Hinduism is that they, re, they rejoice in paradox. They, they don't worry about paradox or contradiction. It all is part of the fact that we can't ever understand everything. And so a lot of things, these things aren't going to make sense to us. So in the Puranas and even in the Vedas, there are different stories of creation that pop up in all different kind of ways. And for us, we don't like all that contradiction. But to the Hindu, it's just different ways of seeing the same truth. And sometimes Brahma is seen as the creator on his own. Other times he's seen as being created by other gods. Sometimes he's seen as a revelation of, say, Vishnu or Shiva. Uh, so sometimes, depending on the story, he takes different forms and he shows up in different ways. But generally speaking, he's given credit for the creation of the world that we see. Now remember, th their idea of universe and, and world is different than ours. In our creation story, there's one God, one beginning, in the beginning, and God creates the world. That's not the way it is in um, Hindu mindset. In the Hindu mindset, there are many worlds and many universes that continue to get created, sustained through a period of time, destroyed, and then the whole cycle starts over again. So there's a cyclical nature to the way this works. And so in their mind, there's, you're always going through this process of creation, Preservation, destruction, and destruction is not necessarily bad. It's the beginning. The old has to get cleared away so the new can come in. And so that's kind of why you see these different gods kind of forming around the idea of Brahma, who's the creator, Vishnu, the sustainer, Shiva, the destroyer. And it's not just about the world as we know it, as we see it, but as this repetition, this cycle of universes created, sustained, destroyed, and then the process goes over again, over and over again in, in eons. So uh, Brahma's the creator god, and with each one of these creator gods who are male in their depiction, there is a consort that goes along with them. There's a balance. There's the male and the female force. It's part of um, how this cosmogony works. It's how uh, the universe can, can happen. And so um, uh, the consort of Brahma, you often see him with a goddess called Saraswati. She's the goddess of knowledge and uh, art uh, and, and wisdom, knowledge, music, arts, that kind of thing. 
she's usually seen in this white pure dress with the musical instrument just showing um, how she is pure from the very beginning. And so the idea is what Brahma is in force and power to get things going in creation, it's Saraswati that actually makes things happen. So the man does all the talking and the idea is the woman actually makes it happen. See, that's, that's the, the image we get here with all these gods. One is the power that kind of is on the front. The other person is actually the one who implements. And so in the Hindu idea, it's always a pair. The creative process, the sustaining process, even the destroying process is a joint effort between male and female power, male and female um, gifts. And so in this case, the creative power of Brahma is balanced with the creative power of Saraswati, and so the two go together. All right, so that's one couple that kind of emerges out of this uh, millions of gods to the forefront, this creative power that, that um, produces the universe. But as I said, for some reason, probably because creation happens and then goes away, this god really doesn't have, and this goddess really doesn't have the followers, the devotees, devotees that these other two gods have. So let's look at those. This second god that we're looking at now, this is Vishnu. He's the sustainer. And um, he has quite a long series of stories about him. He, he's seen as uh, the all-powerful one who keeps things going who sustains things. Uh, normally he has this dark blue complexion. He, it's the water, the idea that he's the nourisher, the idea that um, he's the one that sustains and gives life to all things. Um, and he's sometimes seen even more power, as I said, than Brahma the creator. Sometimes Vishnu is even seen as the creator in some of these stories. You remember we talked about last week the, the idea of this, this Ramayana, one of those great long epic poems where uh, Rama was seen as an avatar of Vishnu. Krishna, that you know probably more from the Hare Krishna, Krishna movement, Krishna is seen as an avatar of Vishnu. And so that's why you'll see Krishna is mostly blue, right? These are, it's an it's a idea that he's the sustainer of what's happening here. So the idea there is what was created has to be sustained and preserved. This world has to have a power that keeps it together and keeps it going. It's this idea of sovereignty. Someone has to hold this thing in tension and keep these things going. So in Hindu mythology, if you will, or Hindu theology, depending on how you want to phrase it, this is the, the main god that keeps that all together. And there's a whole, in fact, if you look at Hinduism, there's a whole sector of Hinduism that call themselves uh, Vaishnavism. It's it's. The Vaishnavites, they're the ones that worship Vishnu. And so one whole collection of Hinduism are folks devoted to Vishnu. And so the idea is you devote your life to Vishnu, you worship him appropriately, or one of his avatars like Krishna or, Ravna or, or, or Rama or one of these other folks, you devote yourselves to them. And then if they like you... <laughs> If you are in a good relationship with them, they will help you break the cycle of rebirth. And so it's a, a religious devotion that comes alongside. So that's Vishnu the sustainer. Uh, Vishnu's cons, uh, consort is a very popular god in Hinduism called Lakshmi. She's the goddess of wealth and fortune, prosperity, uh, material and spiritual. She's very popular goddess in uh, Hindu worship because of that. People pray to Lakshmi for when they need money, when they need power, when they need prestige. She is the one that gives wealth and prosperity. She's usually seen in this red uh, um, dress, this red garb, this idea that she kind of delivers on those uh, promises, right? And I don't know if we got to it last week when we were talking about this, the, kind of the goals in Hinduism, the, the, the way you work through this, I mean, prosperity is one of those goals. Uh, morality is another one of those goals. Pleasure is one of those goals. You've heard of the Kama Sutra, right? That's, that's the song of pleasure. So those goals are all valid goals in Hinduism, that, that moral life, the pursuit of pleasure, 
pursuit of wealth, these are all okay, as long as you do them well and you do them correctly, and as well as the pursuit of, of release, the pursuit of, of moksha. So all those four ends and goals, Lakshmi can help you with those, can help you with uh, living a better moral life, can help you with your prosperity and wealth, can help you in the pursuit of pleasure, can help you in the pursuit <coughs> of uh, release. So she has this powerful, so she's a very powerful uh, goddess in Hinduism that's worshipped quite frequently uh, all throughout um, the land. Balancing the preservation is now the destruction part. Uh, in Hinduism, there's this appreciation that in order for there to be anything new, something has to go away. The, the plant has to die before the seeds can be dropped and come back up. Uh, it's just the way the cold has to go away. The, 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 there has to be death before there's life. And so who keeps that cycle going? Well, they have this very interesting god, Shiva, who's in charge of this destruction, but you would think this would be a god that nobody wants to follow. I mean, who wants to follow the destroyer? But the thought is that if you're a devotee of Shiva, he works, for, he works in your best interest. So that power is contained for your benefit. And so he's seen as this, on one hand, this powerful god of destruction, but he's also seen as this blessed kind of ascetic person that's just so focused on doing the right thing that if you stay in good with Shiva and you devote yourself to Shiva, his power can actually benefit you. So there's a whole group in um, Hinduism known as the Shivites or the Sh Shavites, depending on how you, who, who you're talking to, but a whole group that follows Shiva as the destroyer. And so you kind of, who is the God that you follow? And in Hinduism, it doesn't matter. Pick one. It's not, you don't have to pick one. And by the way, sometimes in following one, you're allowed to follow the other sometimes and do some other things. There are other gods there. One of the other gods that you can, there's not a, a raging jealousy, but as a, as a rule, you pick one of these two, either Vishnu or Shiva, Shiva, and you follow them. Devote yourself to them. And they protect you and they guard you and they, they take you through your protection. And if you're close enough to them, they will deliver you from this cycle of rebirth. Now, on the positive side, or kind of on the more pleasant side, this is this goddess of Parvati, who's his, the consort of Shiva. And I said goddess of power. Sometimes she's seen as the goddess of love or fertility. Um, she has different faces and different purposes, but she is kind of the softer side of Shiva. It's this kind of tension that they hold between, here's this uh, brutally develop, uh, dedicated ascetic creature, Shiva, that, that actually, according to the legends, is kind of tricked into marriage. <laughs> he doesn't really want to get married, but he's tricked into it by some accounts. And she becomes kind of the softer side and so a lot of times when you're worshiping Shiva, you go through his consort Parvati. And she also, though, has a nasty side, and she comes up with ever different sides. One of her appearances is in the goddess Kali. If you remember some, one of those Indiana Jones movies, you remember he was up against Kali, if you remember that. That's the other side, kind of the, the fanged goddess with blood dripping off. Uh, that's the other side, that she can be the destroyer as well, the judge. And so uh, people commit themselves to Shiv Shiva and Parvati. And each of these are seen as couples. And so they're usually, when you worship them, they, they oftentimes in the temples, they're combined. So that you're kind of seeing them as a couple and worshiping them as a couple. So those, those become known as the, the Trimurti. Now, if you were in my class, I'd have you write an essay and compare the Trimurti with the Trinity. So uh, it's due next week, spelling counts. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but I'd have you write a little essay, like what's the same or difference? Um, this is three revelations of one God. How is that the same or different Trinity? Well, I think there are all kinds of differences and distinctions, but sometimes the analogy is drawn 
But obviously, we're talking about two different things there. In the Trinity, there is one God in three persons. I mean, they're not just the mere appearances of God. They are God, right? That's one major difference. We don't have consorts in this situation. They're not neatly aligned into creator, uh, preserver, and destroyer. That's not God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of differences, but sometimes you'll hear out in the language people say, oh, well, this is just the Hindu version of Trinity. I'm like, mm, no, they're, they're a lot different. You're not doing a justice to Christianity or Hinduism to say they're the same. They're not the same. Right, But the only similarity is they're the number three, and we're talking about gods. Beyond that, there's not a lot of similarity, but people will try to invent one and say that one came from the other or whatever. Um, now, how does this all work out um, practically? And again, I, I feel bad just talking about these three because there are many other gods and goddesses that are worshipped. But those will give you the idea of kind of the, the, the top ones or the, the most popular ones in the Hindu worship tradition. The word for worship in the Hindu tradition is puja. And even more technically, it's called murti puja. It's the idea that you're worshiping gods as they're expressed sometimes in these images. And you do that in homes, and you also do that in temples, and both are appropriate. It's not both are kind of okay, and it's not as ritualistic as even Christianity is about when you must do certain things. You, you can do it daily, multiple times a day, in your home, with or without a priest. And so in your homes, most homes there that you either, depending on which of these camps you fall into, you either have uh, images of, uh, of Vishnu and his consort, or you have an image of Shiva, and his consort, you have them, and you, there's certain rituals you go through of bathing that image is the idea that you're uh, uh, committing yourself to them, respecting them, devoting yourself to them. And there's, you can talk to different Hindus about whether you really believe gods are in these images or whether they're just symbols of a god, and you'll get different answers depending on who you talk to as to the relationship between the gods themselves and these images that you find. You go into temples, and these temples will have, depending, some of the temples are dedicated to one god or another, but you walk into the temples, and sometimes they have multiple gods in there that you can go and worship. But again, the, the, the argument about whether the gods are actually in those images or whether there's just representations of a god who is absent, again, the, the opinion is divided. But you still go through these uh, rituals with or with priest, with, with that, or without a priest. It's a part of way of this bhakti, this way of devotion. The idea being that if you, the God likes you, if you build a relationship with this God, that God will help you through life and get out of this life and get out of even out of this moksha life. And so uh, going back to the original class we had here, some people say, well, you know, all other religions says they have religion and we have a relationship. And I pushed back. I said, that's a little simplistic because relationship talk is, is in a lot of these other religions. Well, this is one of those places where relationship talk is in Hinduism. You can have a relationship with these gods. And you just hope that they help you. I mean, that's, that's the, the tradition behind bhakti. So as we emerge then from this era... You see that now we have three solid ways that you as a Hindu can begin to make your way through this life, break out of the wheel of rebirth, and be released to be one with Brahman. You can do the way of duty and try to wear off your karma and do the right thing and reduce the amount of karma, and hopefully you come back next time a little better than you were this time. And to the average Hindu, that happens over and over again. You don't even know how many lives you have to go through. Or you can take the shortcut and just meditate into the place where you're, you see your Ahman as Brahman. Or there's this third way, that, uh, this way of devotion. And often in Hinduism, it's a mixture of all three. You, you, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You don't put all your money on one number. You do a little of each. You know, you try to wear down your karma, and you meditate, and you bhakti, you, you play, you play, you know, all the hands. And hoping that collectively, that this 
both improves your life in this life, and if you can't get released in this life, and most Hindus don't think they're going to get it in this life, at least average folks, at least you'll come back in a better place next time, right? So that's the idea. So at least that gives you a little feel for kind of practically what the folks are going through and what they're thinking in the Hindu tradition. Now, as we talk about later developments in Hinduism, what I'd like to do is now talk about, turn the page a little bit, and talk about how Hinduism now has to encounter and develop over a period of years based upon its interaction with other religious traditions. And I want to start with its interaction with Christianity. And again, this is a long story that we got like just a few minutes to tell, so I can only just hit the top of the mountains, right, about this stuff. The traditions with regard to um, Christianity in, in India go all the way back to uh, an ancient tradition that it, actually St. Thomas one of the apostles, you know, the one we know as Doubting Thomas, that he made his way to India. And there's some tradition to actually support that. Um, we can't be 100% sure, but there's some reasonably strong um, anecdotal evidence that said that may have very well have happened. Uh, part of that tradition is preserved here at the St. Thomas Basilica. It's the traditional site of the, the burial in India of of Thomas, so somewhere in the area of 72 AD. So it claims to be the place that houses the burial. And as I said, there's some traditional evidence, there's some stories that are told about the remains being moved to one place to another and different people bearing witness to that, which seem to indicate that it may in fact be true. You go inside that place and here's the actual uh, tomb within that basilica um, that you see there. Uh, so just to give you a picture of the belief, the strong belief within India that Christianity has its roots there from the days of the apostles themselves. So um, not later, but there itself. And uh, in fact, there's a church there that claims to be the site of the oldest church still in use. <laughs> there's a claim that it's there from 63 AD. Now, obviously, it's a pretty good building if it survives in 63 AD. It's obviously been rebuilt a few times. But the, it, changed, it claims to be the oldest site of a church still being used from 63 AD. Your, your choice as to whether you choose to believe that. But um, again, the strong idea that Christianity comes right from the days of the apostles in India. In fact, there is a group known as the St. Thomas Christians. Uh, they claim they can trace their roots all the way back to Thomas himself, and so not from a missionary coming into India besides, but all the way back to St. Thomas. So, But it seems that that Christian community, however it was, it was very small and limited. It did not spread as widely as one might hope. Uh, it was just a small minority at best. And so what you did see is if we jump ahead many, many centuries here, you did see some Christian movement into the area. And without getting into a lot of detail, again, just hitting the tops of the mountains, uh, one of the people that you may um, be aware of is a Catholic missionary called Francis Xavier. And so we have a, a rather sizable account of Francis Xavier in the 16th century uh, making his way into India having a relationship with the folks there, having a relationship with the, as part of the papacy, trying to build trade routes and so forth in the 16th century. And so he gets sent to bring Christianity there, Catholic Christianity. Now, there's some controversy about his ministry there. Um, what we're going to see is a theme that emerges through this, quote, missionary activity, is this desire to import not just Christianity as a faith, but as a culture. <laughs> and so it seems like as Christians came to these places to bring the good news of Jesus, they also felt the need once they got there to bring their culture into this place. And some of the excuses that were used to bring that culture is when they got there, they found as part of the worship a couple, a couple practices that made them nervous. 
One was this whole caste system or this level system that we talked about last week, the Varna system where there's the Brahmins uh, and the, the, the priestly caste that is on top, the warrior ruler class, and then the merchant class and the laborer class, and then the untouchables. The Christian community would come in there and say, well, that's, that's just not Christian at all. We've got to blow up that caste system, which as you might imagine, creates a bit of a cultural stir <laughs> in a society that had learned to live with that system for centuries. And so uh, one of the problems they ran into, these Catholic missionaries and even the Protestant ones that we're going to talk about in a moment, originally you run into this caste system and right away you saw missionaries trying to break down that caste system, which created, again, this cultural war. And you, you wonder to what extent that has to do with the gospel as one of the first things, right? The other practice that gets a lot of press is um, uh, the practice of uh, what they call sati, which is, it comes out of the mythology of the fact that um, one of the goddesses dies and throws herself on the fire when her, her consort dies. And so this practice of widows who are, when their husband dies, the widows throwing themselves on the fire and destroying themselves, uh, you know, when their husband goes. So I know that sounds a little bit unintelligible here in our day and age, but, uh, and the truth is it's probably exaggerated. The reports of it were magnified beyond reality, but it did happen sometimes. And the missionaries kind of, that was another practice that they looked, they said, this can't be Christian. And so all that to say, when these Catholic missionaries and later the Protestant missionaries came into India, there was this desire to transform not just the faith, but the culture. And sometimes their language, writing back home about those practices, were not all that loving, quite frankly. Uh, Francis Xavier especially, I read some of the letters he sent home, and sometimes he was very critical and condemning and, and um, kind of needlessly cruel about these people. And he even kind of talks about his strategy for getting some of these temples torn down. He saw that as mass idolatry, right? And so he, he'd work with the children and he'd get the children involved and then he'd employ the children to go back into the towns and start bringing down the temples. I mean, he, he used some methods that probably wouldn't be appreciated in our today's culture. But this desire to just bring Christianity with a vengeance into this culture. And so it created this tension uh, from the very beginning between Hinduism and Christianity, because this, this drive to bring not just the gospel, but to bring the whole Western culture along with you. And that became a challenge, especially even from the 16th century. Well, as you know, it's not just Roman Catholics that make their way into India. Probably the most famous missionary that you know about that would have gone into India is William Carey. He's kind of known the father of modern missions. Um, sincere uh, believer, of course, uh, one of the founders of the Baptist movement, um, kind of started off in the, in the Church of England, but eventually became, quote, a dissenter, and which means in that particular, he moved over and became a Baptist. So it wasn't popular to be a Baptist in England in those days. So I'm uh, sorry to you Baptists, but in those days it was kind of a big decision to not to leave the Church of England and become a Baptist. So he became a Baptist. But <clears throat> he wrote this, um, uh, this important treatise that really, missions in that day was kind of, um, it was just getting started. And the idea, at least in the Protestant circles, this idea that you would go and convert other people. It just was a new idea to really think about that in a modern way. And so he wrote this intriguing, folks still read it today. It's called An Inquiry into the Obligations of Christians to You Means for the Conversion of Heathens. That's a nice title, right? It's, it's, it was just an argument whether we should go try to convert the heathen. Now, in a day where part of the theology was God chooses who's in and who's out, Obviously, the question has to be asked, do we have to go tell them? I mean, God's already made his selection. For some reason, he's chosen England and Europe, but not India. I don't know why. Right? And so there's this idea, like, should you really 
spend your time and energy going out and proclaiming the gospel to the heathen. I mean, God has made this choice. And so he's, he's citing this example. He goes back into Acts and argues that, yes, we should go. And sure enough, the next year he goes, right? He, he gets in, he goes to India in the following years, and he begins to set up a mission there. And I, won't, I can't get into all to the long story of how it works, but he works alongside to build these mission stations there and a college there um, that still exists today, actually. The idea was to educate. Now, the thing about Kerry was he still had his British perspectives, and some of the commentaries out there are not kind to William Carey about, again, bringing the British culture into India. But as people go, he did, I think, seek to understand the people. I mean, one of the things he took on was learning Sanskrit and learning some of these other languages and translating their material into his material so he could read them. So I think he, he has pretty good credentials there. He was, by instinct, too, a botanist. And so he tried to improve agriculture, tried to study there. So um, I, there, he has his critics out there, to be sure. But I think he had a genuine interest in um, bringing the gospel in there and in the process really kind of helped found the whole Baptist missionary movement. I mean, he was one of the founders of what became uh, the British Missionary Society, right? So the idea of bringing the gospel and living with the people and trying to learn their culture, trying to listen, bring the story, uh, that was kind of, he was, it was new in that day. So let me just encourage you to go out. I wish I could spend more time on him. Get a work on William Carey. Read that through. Really a foundational and pivotal picture uh, of, of missions in that day, uh, 18th century into the 19th century. And of course, we couldn't talk about Christianity in India without mentioning um, Mother Teresa, uh, just a, a saint among saints. I mean, and now that's literal. The Catholic Church has actually elevated to her to sainthood. Um, I interesting story. Um, 1946, just after the war, she has this experience, and it's just, she says, the call within the call. I mean, she just said, in fact, I have a quote here, I think, written in my notes. It says, yeah, I was to leave the convent and help the poor while living among them. It was an order. To fail would have been to break the faith. I mean, that's, that was her calling. Um, she felt like she had a direct call from God to leave the convent and minister to the poor, and you know the story. I mean, she's a powerful woman that produced much change. I remember one story hearing, uh, he was, she was traveling with a rock musician. I forget which rock musician she was going through India with. And at one point, she needed a, She was with a group, and they needed to get on a train to go somewhere. And, of course, she didn't carry the money. So she just walked up to the train conductor and said, I need so many tickets to so-and-so. And the train conductor just handed it to her. <laughs> and the rock musician was such, he's never seen anybody with such power. I mean, she just went up and said, give me the tickets, and they gave them to her. I mean, she amazing. For a little woman, she had a lot of power. So I uh, just mentioned that in there. So th the point being, then, that as Hinduism develops and grows, it has to dialogue with Christianity. And it has this challenge with it, it that most of the Christians, when they came, they come not just with a message, but with a culture. And so some foundation stones were laid that later when the British would come in and kind of, ex, kind of push their rule, what's known as the British Raj, they saw that as an extension of Christianity. And so you, you're in this position now where you have to do something with this powerful culture that's now in the midst of your culture. Do you work with it or do you work against it? Do you fight it or do you join it? And so we're going to see how that develops as, they, as this process develops. So it's not just Christianity that they have to deal with. There's another fundamental religion that begins to enter the picture. And as I said, we'll deal with Islam as a religion after Easter. But just to let you know, 
Hinduism has to deal with Islam too. And it produced a lot of tension very early on. Uh, we, the, the building, here's the building that's credited with being the first mosque, probably the first mosque in India, um, 629. And if you know anything about the history of Islam, which we'll get to eventually, you'll know this is just within years after what's called uh, the, it's what's called as the Great Hijra, where, where um, Muhammad moves Islam to Medina. And it's this kind of big start push. Uh, he starts making, he starts kind of preaching Islam around 610, so it develops from there. But you can see within a very few decades, this faith is now pushing its way into India. And so they claim within, you know, with, within decades of the start of this faith, it's already in India. So that's what they claim. There's that first mosque. And you can go online and actually get a tour of this, and a guy will take you through and show you what's in there. It's a pretty cool little um, um, view. Now, we don't really know what the nature of these early mosques were or what the early relationship was, but we see very quickly, within 100 years or so, there are actually um, military expeditions moving in. One of the things we're going to realize about Islam is very early on, they began military campaigns as a way of extending um, their faith. It went hand in hand, and um, so we're going to see that, and this is, India is no exception. So Within a hundred years, or so, or less than a hundred years of Muhammad, you have uh, folks pushing into India and begin to establish uh, camps, centers in there of Islamic faith. And right away, you see that there's going to be a tension. If the tenet of Islam is there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, how do you move into a society that says, no, there are millions of gods, all of which are okay. And millions of texts, or thousands of texts, how do those two religions learn to get along? I mean, they're, they're not anything alike. And so Islam, when it comes into this place, it was one thing for the Islam to deal with Judaism, which still believed in one God. One thing for Islam to deal with Christianity, who still believed in God. How does Islam gonna deal with a culture who believes in millions of gods? with millions of idols of millions of gods. You can see that there's a cultural clash right away. And this would become a tension that lasts for centuries when Islam comes into this nation. The expansion continues, and again, jumping through too many centuries than I care to because we don't really have time to do much else. You move from into what's called the Delhi Sultanate, and you can see it's kind of in three stages here. Uh, on your, I guess would be on your left, it kind of begins up in the northern area with Islam comes in, and the Delhi Sultan is just basically conquest of territory where they exert their influence. And so it begins in the north. And then you can see in the second stage, it kind of pushes to the south. And then there are a series of wars and, and revolts, actually, of Hinduism that push it back, and it deteriorates toward the end of the Sultan Sea, where it's up again in the northeast quadrant. And so it goes through this phase. And the key to understand what the tensions between Islam and Hindu really intensified during this period. There were periods where the two tried to get along, that is, there were some emperors in this place that tried to kind of coexist. You do your religion, I'll do mine. But as it developed, there are others that were less tolerant. They felt this missionary zeal to convert these Hinduism, these Hindus into their faith. And so increased tension between Hindus and Muslims during this period, it just increased uh, division and conflict. The, the pot was starting to boil. 
And you can see it's through the 16th century. So if you figure it starts in the 8th century and goes, it's 800 years of Muslim rule in India. Hinduism has to do something to survive during that period. Especially in areas and in times where Muslim leaders are saying, either become a Muslim or die, or pay this incredible exorbitant tax so that you can keep your religion. Uh, that's really the tension that was going through all those years. As the Delhi Sultanate began to kind of fade away, you move into a new period of Muslim rule called the Mughal Empire, or some people pronounce it Mughal Empire. It's a new kind of wave of Muslim domination. And this kind of, this happens for another 300 years, way up into the middle of the 1850s. So a thousand years plus of Muslim rule in India. You can understand the tensions that exist. And just like as happened in the Delhi Sultanate, in the Mughal Sultanate, or the Mughal Empire, you had some emperors that were a little more tolerant than others. Some of them just became outright oppressive in terms of their demand that people convert to Islam. Others, a little more tolerant, but overall oppressive. And so the tensions are really, really tight. A couple little facts about the Mughal Empire that I'll kind of weave into the story. Uh, you know the Taj Mahal, right? The famous Taj Mahal. One of the Mughal empires are the ones that built that, uh, was the one that built that, grieving his departed wife. And in fact, was later imprisoned by his son <laughs> for his violation. The other thing, there's this interesting religion that sprouts up during the Mughal empire called Sikhism, and we'll talk about it in a moment, but it's kind of this faith that emerges out of this need to survive in the midst of Muslim Islamic uh, pressure. So when you get into the modern era, the era of middle 1500s, the Mughal Empire is beginning to wane. It's beginning to deteriorate. Uh, the emperors are beginning to lose power. It's pushed back up again into that northeastern quadrant that you, or sector that you see. It begins to be, um, more territorial, and it's in this weakened place. Well, what happens towards the end of this is that the British come in and with their East India Company, and they start to build this economy based upon imports and exports to India. A huge part of their economy gets based upon this. And so the whole British rule comes in, and when the Mughal Empire begins to decline, that's when the British Empire comes in and starts to really reign and start to exert its influence and its power in there and goes from being a, a, mili I mean a, a merchant thing, an economy thing, the East India Company being commercial, they become a military. They become a governing presence. They take direct control of the territory in the absence of this Mughal Empire. So imagine you're a Hindu, you're from... Uh, you're in this Hinduism tradition, and you go from a thousand years of Muslim rule to Christian rule. You see, that's what they experienced. They went a thousand years of Muslim rule, and you just went over to Christian rule. It's just you swept one dictator to another. That's what happened if you're a Hindu person in India. You just switched dictators. And so how do you survive in that case? Well, we'll jump to the end of the story, and then I'll jump back and walk through what happens during that British domination period, the period we go through to British Raj. The way that will end is we get to this place, and I threw this in here, I could have probably waited to the end of the British discussion, but when the British were finally done, it was after World War II, uh, they had realized that their time in India was now over. The, national, uh, the nationals in India had united, Gandhi and others had brought them together, they clearly knew it was their time to leave. And so what they did in 1947, against, again, after the war, is they actually partitioned India into different sectors. And it was along religious lines. 
So the Hindus would get that middle section that you see all there in blue, and then you see the light blue, and then um, to the west, in that greenish area, that's the area that would become Pakistan. And the whole reason for Pakistan's existence was for Muslims to have a place to live. So it was to divide the Muslims that were there from the Hindus that were there so they could have a separate country. So there, there was this division there. And there's also, in that day, it was, on the, it was in eastern Pakistan, if you will, that later became the country of Bangladesh. That was also a place where Muslims were to lead. So after this thousand years of Muslim domination, when the country finally became independent, it was actually divided along religious lines, where the Hindus could live and where the uh, Muslims would live. Now, there are a couple problems with the way this was done. First of all, what about the Sikhs? The Sikhs were all in this northern area known as the Punjab. They had no place to go, and they were arguing for their own country. Well, there's no Punjab, there's no, there's no country for the Sikhs here. And they got kind of squashed. And what makes matters worse is when they drew the lines as to where these countries should be drawn, it was a lawyer in London that had never been there. So he's like drawing lines right through people's property and stuff. And so as a result, some say as much as 10 million people had to change places as a result of this, uh, this partition of India, as it's called. I mean, 10 million people had to, like, if you were a Muslim living on the Hindu side, you better get to Muslim territory. And if you were a Hindu living on the Muslim side, you better get to Hindu territory. And if you're a Sikh, you just pray because you're caught in the middle because you ain't got nowhere to go. And, and estimates are that maybe a million people were killed in the riots. It's horrible, horrible um, devastation that went on during this period. And tensions continued, right, about the British division here. And that's why there's still tensions there between uh, Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus there, the partition that was drawn in 1947 did, was not satisfactory, and it was just a, simply a matter of the British saying, I want out of here. They were running out of money. They were tired of doing it. They were under one array as fast as they could, and they, quite frankly, did a poor job of transitioning, and they left kind of this vacuum that just kind of ended up destroying the people. So uh, not a happy story of how this thing worked out, but so the, the part I want to see you about want you to see about Hinduism is now so they're put in this position. How are they going to define their religion after being dominated first by Muslims for a thousand years and now Christianity is in charge under that British reign? Now you begin to see why Gandhi says, I like your, Christ, I like your Christ but not your Christian. His experience of our Christians were not a great experience. So let's talk then about that experience with this British Raj that went then, that intervening time with the descent of the Mughal Empire to the coming up of the, till we finally have this partition. One of the things I want you to see is during this period, Hinduism goes through this transformation of modernism. Part of what it does is how can we figure out how to blend all these other religions that are coming in to our faith and what kind of changes is that going to bring to a Hindu tradition? Well, one of the things it does is bring these modernists in that want to change things. And so just to give you, again, I wish I had more time to go in this um, with more detail, you run into these very colorful figures during this period that really... Uh, helped to redefine modern Hinduism. One of these fellows was a, somebody by the name of Ram Rohan Roy. And he was one that sought very definitely to kind of um, reform. While much of what was brought into Hinduism there's, those days was looked as a threat, there were some that saw there was some reforms that had to take place here. Um, this guy is sometimes called the father of the Indian Renaissance. What he tries to do is bring in this idea that we really have, we do need some social reform here. 
We do need to do something about this caste system. We do need to do something about uh, this practice of sati. We do need to do, there has to be this, this education system. There has to be something that we have to, to use. And so he tried to borrow from the British system of schools, build in school systems for children. And so he has this pushback. But what's interesting about his, him is he also pushed a, a, a back against the uh, British, unrealistic British demands. And so he's this interesting kind of reformer, but still clear, clearly in the Hindu tradition. He wants to reform from within. He doesn't reject Hinduism. He wants to reform from within. But he does want to bring and learn what he can from the British ways of doing things to bring social justice and social reform into the culture. Uh, he finds this, uh, this group called the Brahma Samaj. Uh, it's this idea of let's talk about how we can modernize uh, Hinduism and begin to bring some changes into the Hindu tradition. So there's one figure that's interesting. You go back and look. Some folks he was say he was influenced by the Unitarians because what he tried to say is that we, there is really only one God in Hinduism. Let's go back to the one God that lies. Let's go back to that unifying God. So some people say he was influenced by the Unitarians of, the, of his day. So one factor, again, one way of trying to blend all these different cultures into Hinduism. Another interesting character was this fellow, let's see if I can get him up on screen here, fellow by the name of uh, Sarasvati. And um, he's interesting because he kind of is a conservative. You know, what, whatever happens, whenever you get into these situations where a new modernistic group comes along, sometimes the tendency is to go more conservative and to say, we've got to get back to our roots. And so Sarasvati was also a very, a very um, he wanted to introduce social change too, but his way of saying it is, let's go back to the Vedas. Let's go back to the Vedas, because if you really understand the Vedas, you will understand uh, what's the real truth. You know, what's, what's the, what's the, what did they really teach? And if you really understood what they taught and got rid of all this stuff that came later and get back to the sources, you would see that it was a very equitable situation. And so let's just get back to the Vedas. So that was one way to move. I know I'm skipping through these quickly, but um, I'm looking at the time here. Another fellow was uh, this fellow Ramakrishna. And, and long story, poor background, went through all kinds of stuff, eventually discovers this light at the end of his life, and he discovers this truth. And ultimately, the truth becomes that all gods are the same God. And he's the one that you know, gets quoted all the time, where there are all many paths to the same God. All right? this, is, this is Ramakrishna talking. So that was his way of solving this tension of all these cultures that were there around him. His, the idea that there's this single God that's behind all these appearances of God, that, that basic assumption in Hinduism that there's no conflict between one God and many gods. It's the same truth. He just extends that to say all these gods, these other religions, whether you talk about Allah or whether you talk about the Trinity or where you talk about Jesus, all these are all gods leading to the same God. That's Ramakrishna. And one of his disciples, or when it was followers was a person by the name of Vivekananda. And uh, this is a very interesting, colorful factor. He's the guy that really brings this whole thought, this Indian thought, into the West. Uh, he goes to the World Council of Religions in Chicago and delivers this uh, address to the religious cultures of the time, which again, this was at the height of liberalism in the United States. And this idea, this, this thought that all religions, they're leading to the same God. That's Vivekananda. Interesting truth about him, that little head garb, it wasn't really popular in his day. That's just what he wore around. It was part of his persona. It was his cap he chose. <laughs> but interesting, colorful fellow. Very popular salon guy. People would vent him over. Very wealthy, influential people would go and listen to him. Uh, very influential in bringing 
Hinduism and Hindu ideas into the West. And of course, we have to mention Mahatma Gandhi. I, obviously, there's whole movies, books. I can't really even go begin to touch on his life, but he becomes a very influential figure in bringing to end the whole Raj. This idea that this this commitment to what's called ahimsa, nonviolence. That that's a Hindu idea that's immersed in there. Do no harm. I mean, that comes out of his religious Hindu tradition. So. The idea of nonviolent, the idea of nonviolent protest, that's all rooted in the Hindu tradition of what's called ahimsa. Do no wrong, do no evil, nonviolence. That, that's from his background, and he brings that into his fight and his argument against the British Raj. So very powerful, thoroughly Hindu. Some folks try to make him out to a quasi-Christian. He's not. He's thoroughly Hindu. And his, his nonviolent protest actions that came out of his Hindu faith. And ultimately, he becomes a key pivotal figure in bringing down, at the end of this British reign, he brings it down and helps with that um, establishment of an independent democratic India. And lastly, I'll just talk, to, uh, talk about, some of you may have heard of Pramahansa Yogananda. Yugana, He's the guy that brought made yoga popular in the U.S. I mean, you know, now everybody and their brother seems to do yoga, right? So um, he's the guy that kind of started bringing the yoga practices into, he started this uh, self-realization fellowship. You may remember that back in the 20s, and it went on for a period of time. But he went around and popularized, uh, popularized yoga in, in the U.S. So again, those are just a few names I could... Um, go on. I want to just me briefly mention, very, very briefly, because we only have a couple minutes here, I want to very, very briefly mention two other religious traditions that come out of this Hindu tradition or alongside of it. Let me just say up front, folks try to say that these religions are kind of emerged from Hinduism, but I will tell you the people in these faiths do not believe they're trying to come out of anything. They believe this was uh, uh, revealed directly from them. So just very briefly, uh, one of these religious traditions uh, was a tradition called Jainism, if you heard of that. Uh, that is a tradition that believes in this revelation of Starting in the 5th or 6th century, the reason I have kind of 10th century here is that the founder of this claims that he comes along in a tradition of people. And so because the Jains believe in this idea of reincarnation, they believe that there were past leaders of this faith that date back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Mahavira is viewed as what they call the 24th, 24th Tirthankara, you don't have to know that word, it won't be on the test. But it's 24 revelations of God, and he's the last in the line. And the way this cosmogony works is that the, the society, the universe goes through cycles, and we are kind of now in a new cycle of destruction, and so the last Tirthankara, or the last, we would think of him similar to a, a voice of God, the last one has now appeared. And we're not going to see another one again for a long period of time until we're good enough to be sent another one. All right? So he's kind of the last in a long line. And so of those 24, the only ones we suspect are historical is uh, Mahavira himself, who was there, again, probably the 6th century B.C., and maybe the one who came before them. So some people push that back to the 10th century. A lot of debates as to, I mean, yeah, a lot of debates here as to where this starts. But the idea is these Tirthankaras, they revealed themselves to God. And the idea is not so much that you're devoted to gods, the Hindu gods. They're, in fact, the Hindu gods are not all really that important. The real pressure of Jainism is that you really have to follow the way. And there's the part that you can follow it as an ascetic, or you can follow it as somebody who supports an ascetic. And the idea is that if you're one of the vows, that if you're one of the monks that are really pursuing this, you're closest to release. 
And you have these five vows, and I put them up on the screen there, of ahimsa, this nonviolence, truthfulness, non-thieving, non-possession, chastity. And they go to real extremes to make sure that in all their lives, this is trying to purify themselves to an ultimate degree, to the place that some, uh, some theories about Mahavira, for example, he put a mask over his face to make sure he doesn't breathe in bugs. You know, he doesn't want to destroy bugs. To the place that he doesn't even eat vegetables. He waits for vegetables who are ready to be thrown away in the trash. That he could eat. So he doesn't do damage to a living thing. All right, so it's this idea of really extreme asceticism for the monks. And if they f pursue that, they experience release. And for the people around them, the idea is you support the monks. And then hopefully if you do a good job supporting the monks, maybe you can come back next time as a monk. Right and kind of go through this. So uh, another whole level of that. One of the practical outcroppings of this faith is because you're not allowed to do harm. I mean, that's like number one. A lot of these folks can't go into agriculture because the whole essence of agriculture is you kill stuff. You kill plants and you kill animals. So you can't go into ag So a lot of these folks went into banking and into merchandising and they become successful merchants throughout, um, throughout that area. Um, and also, you'll notice I put this up there because it has that little swastika in there to show you that the swastika is an ancient symbol coming back at that Indo-Aryan place. It isn't, the Nazis didn't invent that. It was around a long time before, and it didn't mean anything like what it came to be meant. It's just talking about embracing the four corners of the earth and this pathway to get out of that cycle of, of wheel of rebirth. So uh, you'll see that associated quite often with Jainism. And let me just... T touch briefly on this uh, religion of Sikhism, and of course I misspelled it, I think. Uh, but <clears throat> I, I, there should be, it's, it's S-I-K-H-I-S-M. So apparently this was one of those two in the morning slides that I should have thought again before I put up, but I misspelled Sikhism. But <clears throat> this particular religion. It comes during that Mughal Empire, that Mughal Empire where um, Muslim domination. So Guru Nanak, he, he comes up with this kind of this, again, they would say revealed from God. They wouldn't say it's a reaction to or an accommodation to. It is born in this cycle of this Islamic domination where there's one God. In his revelation, he comes to this place where there is one God. <laughs> that all gods are one God. And so it's an emphasis upon this one God and the duty of everyone to just live a, a correct life. And so boils down all this Hinduism to a pure practice. And so get rid of all the superstition, get rid of all the... the the religiosity and just live a good life under one God. All right, that's kind of the essence of this. Well, this becomes kind of a way of life, and to some people, Sikhism is a version of Hinduism. To some folks, Sikhism is a separate religion from Hinduism. Uh, depending on who you talk to, some see themselves as both. Some see themselves as they're irreconcilable. But there is this different tradition. And after Guru Nanak, there is nine other gurus that come. And so one after the other comes along. And during this process, the tensions, again, with especially Islam, Islam begin to build, begin to build. And at some point, their kind of pacifist idea that you're supposed to live at peace, the gurus began to take on another dimension, say, no, you have to fight. And so that's why some of the Sikh um, devotees now, you'll see them wear a sword with them, a little sword. It's this idea that we will fight for what we believe. Now, and for a period of time, the tensions were very, very tight with Hinduism and with India. It's, you can imagine the both during the... Muslim era where they were being oppressed. And again, some of those emperors would work alongside the Sikhs. Others would insist that they become Muslims. And 
part of the ideals in Sikhism is there are a number of martyrs that lost their life in the cause being put to death. And then, so on the one hand, they have this tension against um, tension against Muslims, but they also have a tension against Christianity because it was all during that Muslim or the British rule that they were left out of the whole partition. In fact, that left kind of a bitter taste in their mouths. And if you may remember with Indira Gandhi when she was in charge, you remember at one point she kind of uh, closed off the temple the Sikh temple, and you remember her own Sikh bodyguards turned on her and, and assassinated her because they had had enough with getting pushed around. And so uh, m by now a lot of those things have calmed down, but there are still Sikhs out there who still want their own state. So there's tension still in there. So all that to say, you can see how these different religious traditions of Islam and Christianity coming into India, it causes Hinduism to rethink itself to reinvent itself, to talk about how it's going to interact with that. Well, that is a very, very brief tour of a couple thousand years of Hindu history recently, but at least it gives you a feel for some of the dynamics that were going on. So we'll kind of bring our discussion of Hinduism to a close now and uh, with a word of prayer, and then after the prayer we'll kind of open it up for questions. So Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to do this very quick whirlwind tour of thousands of years of history. And uh, it's a lot of information piled on top of one another. But Father, we just want to remember that through it all, you are sovereign. That none of this happened without your knowledge, quite frankly, without your permission. And Father, as we see how you work through history, it's our desire that whenever we come into a culture that's opposed to what we think, we think twice about when we go in with the message. We have no desire to bring with them our, our cultural baggage, our, our moral superiority, our cultural superiority. We don't go in with those ideas. It's not as if we have all the answers and we're there to tell them where they're wrong. We just want to go in as simple witnesses of your truth. We want to learn the lessons of history and not do damage where we don't need to do damage. And while we know that the gospel of Christ will always challenge us to rethink our behavior and rethink where we come from, we have every responsibility to go in without all the baggage that comes from our culture and make that part of the decision. We want to do nothing that puts a stumbling block in front of someone finding Christ. And we we study these other cultures and they seem strange and foreign to us, but the truth applies to right there around us. So many times when we're dealing with people around us, we bring our cultural baggage to the discussion. We make them accept church culture as well as the gospel. And Father, I just pray that we would learn the lesson of history to separate out the message from all this cultural context. Help us to be sensitive to the context in which we are breathing the gospel. Through your spirit, we pray. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat>